Welcome to Blind Abilities. I'm Simon Bonifant. Are you interested in learning about how the blind and visually impaired could successfully cook in the kitchen? Maybe you are a blind and visually impaired person looking for tips and tricks to make that perfect recipe just a little bit easier. Well, whatever level or situation you find yourself in, the Cooking Without Looking TV show and podcast has something for everyone. We've had like recipes that are complicated and then very simple recipes. So everybody is always, always, always invited. We'd love to have you. Airing for 23 years, the Cooking Without Looking TV show and podcast provides blind and visually impaired cooks from around the world the opportunity to share their story as well as to cook their favorite recipes live on the show for everyone to see. As we used to say, live on tape, we just do it all live by the seat of our pants. Subscribe to them on YouTube or wherever you get podcasts. So without further ado, grab your snack and settle in as you listen to the team from Cooking Without Looking. I always say that life is like a party and everybody's invited. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another podcast episode. My name is Simon Bonifant, and today we're going to be talking about food. So I'm giving you a fair warning that if you're listening to this and you may be hungry, I would encourage you to grab a snack or grab a meal and settle in as you listen to this podcast because we wouldn't want you to go hungry listening to our guests today. Joining me in the virtual studio today is Renee Rentmeester. She is the creator and executive producer of the Cooking Without Looking podcast and TV show. And along with her, we have Alan Preston, who is one of the co-hosts of the Cooking Without Looking TV show. So we're going to be talking about food, talking about tips for cooking, talking about the wonderful success of the show and how it's evolved over the years. It's great to have you, Renee and Alan. Thanks for coming on Blind Abilities today. How you folks doing? Hey, thanks for having us, Simon. Yes. Well, Renee, I'd like to turn it over to you first. For those who have never heard of Cooking Without Looking, tell us what it is and give us an overview. Well, it's a TV show that actually started in South Florida and PBS 20, 23 years ago. I created it because I thought that there was a whole group of people that really wasn't being heard or, or being seen. And, and I believe that to be uh, people who were blind and visually impaired. And so I didn't know anyone at the time. So I got on these list serves, which are like emails that you get from different groups. And the largest group were blind cooks and blind chefs. And I'm like, well, this is cool. So I would read the emails and I was better able to understand people who are blind or visually impaired and their needs and their thoughts um, after not knowing anyone who, who had vision issues. Okay, great. And what was the impetus for you to take your ideas and turn it into a show? Well, I've got a background in TV since I was like 17 years old, and I'm not 18. So I... <laughs> <laughs> That was just my tool. I'm, I'm not into fame or fortune. It was just my tool. And I found that I thought that if people saw people who are blind or visually impaired actually doing something, it would be a lot of fun, but people would learn. I called it edutainment because I, I think a lot of times people who are sighted are afraid to ask blind people about their lives or about what they see or whatever. And this was a way to open up a conversation in a really fun way. So I just used my tool of, of television and production and everything to do just that. Yeah, let's talk about that for a minute because I'd like to go just beyond the blindness and beyond the blindness world a little bit. Talk to us a little bit about what you have done in your television career, what kind of projects you worked on and how that kind of fed into you having that experience and those skills that are so vital to producing and running a TV show. Since I started really young, I started into TV 
in high school when the Ron Burgundy era was, when uh, we were going from film to videotape. I learned from the ground up. I was also one of those people that there was no job menial enough for me or great enough for me. I would do whatever someone asked me to do so that I could learn. And then when I got to CBS, I did the advertising and PR part of it. I was a spokesperson for the CBS station in Miami. But I I also produced the PSAs, the public service announcements. I also was nominated for two Emmys. Uh, one was for the writing of a documentary on youth gangs where I hung out in the middle of the night with youth gangs and police officers in Miami who were you know, the gang officers. So I was nominated for an Emmy for that. And then I was nominated for an Emmy for a series of Black History Month spots where I interviewed real live people from the civil rights era in Miami. And that was like totally cool because they were the historians. They spoke the real history from their point of view from six. It was cool. It was like having a history book come alive. I also like wrote ad copy, created ads after Hurricane Andrew because our TV station, everything went down. Now, telling you how much I've learned from TV from the bottom up, when the Bosnian and Herzegovian War happened and when it was finished, they were given their rights to create their own TV stations. It was sort of like if the FCC here would go, okay, we're out of it. You you guys do your thing. So I was asked to speak to all these um, Bosnians and Herzegovians who had been on two sides and then got together. And I told them how to create a TV station. I've done a little bit of everything. Wow. So you really were able to leverage the power of journalism to work with some underrepresented groups. And it sounds like you really knew the importance of having that exposure and giving that exposure to the world. When you step back from your professional career in CBS and your work in TV, what made you find the blind and visually impaired community? Had you had interactions with blind or visually impaired people before? Not at all. And I found a lot of people who are sighted have not either. I just felt that it was a whole group of people that no one knew anything about. I didn't know about people who were blind or visually impaired. And I felt sort of sad because I felt like this is a group that's being left out and no one knows them because everyone's just afraid to talk to one another. That's why I decided to use that group. I've always been like that since I was little. Like if I was on the playground when I was five and I saw people that weren't being talked to, like kids that were all by themselves, I'd always go by them. I honestly, to this day, if I see people who I don't even know, I'll walk up to them. And if they're all by themselves, I'll start talking because I feel so sad uh, for people who are just left out. Well, that's such a great mentality to have because you never will know who you can meet and who you can talk to unless you actually start talking to them and and start a dialogue and start sharing information. I think that's a wonderful lesson to share with the listeners as well. That's right. And we can learn from everyone. We can learn from each other. We don't have to just hang in our little groups and, you know, we can cross those lines. There's not like a metal in between us. We can talk to one another and we'll let each other. I always say that life is like a party and everybody's invited. Wow, that's beautiful. (laughs) That's that's very nice. Thanks. So you mentioned that this idea came to you through the blindness listservs. What was that like for you when you first started to think about blind people cooking? I know that sometimes when sighted people first hear about blind people doing things that are seemingly ordinary, they flip it and make it more than it is and make it out to be something amazing, something to be (laughs) very out of the ordinary. But because you had a lot of very progressive beliefs, I'm wondering what was that like for you when you stumbled upon that fact that blind people can cook and maybe even a lot better than some sighted people I know, right? Yeah, that's true. You know, I'm just not that kind of person that worries about what 
other people can do or can't do. I bow to like giving everyone their human dignity. Actually, I never once was worried about anyone doing anything. And, and Alan, you, you've been there where that one man actually stuck his hand in boiling water because that's the, just the way he made his meatballs. <laughs> I just believe in people and their abilities. We don't focus at the show on, on disabilities. When the groups, the listservs I was in, which I'm in some of them still, they were actually just cooking groups featuring with blind people. And the blind people were all talking about their escapades in the kitchen or whatever, but nothing really freaked me out. In fact, reading them, Oftentimes, if I didn't know that it were blind people talking about being in the kitchen and cooking, I, I probably wouldn't have really noticed much of a difference. You got to remember that hunger does not discriminate. Blind people <laughs> are hungry too, right? There Sam? you go. Absolutely. Yeah, and, yes. And, you, know, if you don't have somebody, if you're not fortunate enough to have somebody there to cook it for you, you got to do it yourself. <laughs> Yes, I, absolutely. I got a baby I just thought of this morning. I'm going to cook it up my George Foreman grill when we're done here. I guess that's sort of cooking, right? Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> So you started the show 23 years ago, which is very great. Uh, congratulations on your wonderful success. And I think this is mm -hmm. a really great opportunity, not only for sighted folks, but also blind folks, because as you both have probably found, there can be a stigma amongst blind people and a fear amongst blind people about cooking. And some blind people think it's very hard to cook and some blind people don't know if they would be able to do it. And I think there's that same fear and that same intimidation a little bit that some sighted people feel and some blind people feel that maybe there isn't around other areas of blindness. And cooking is one of those things that I think carries over to both groups until blind people are familiar with cooking and have that knowledge. So the fact that you're able to do this both for sighted people to see what the blind can do, but also for the blind to look at other blind role models and say, well, if they could do it in the kitchen, then and I'm sure I could. That's very inspiring. And I think it really resonates with me, that fact of the peer support and the peer network of just sharing information. That's exactly right. One of the first shows we shot actually had a man who, uh, he was a blind professor of cooking over at Florida International University. He was pre-Alan. Alan's been here all these years. He was just a, a little part of it. And we had a, like a live studio audience. And he had macular degeneration. And what he did was he grabbed for a white towel. However, he actually stuck his hand in some whipped cream. And uh, one of the ladies in the audience who had just gone blind uh, like seven months before, she was an elderly lady. She came up to me afterward and said that watching him make that mistake actually made her feel better about going back into the kitchen after all those years. Because if this man who made his living cooking blind could do it and make a mistake, she could too. So I think it's mostly a fear, even sighted and blind, a fear of being in the kitchen and making a mistake. So you make a mistake, big deal, you fix it, you know, and if you can't be fixed, make something else. You know, life goes on, you know, when you come to a speed bump, you just don't stop your car, you roll over it. So just keep moving, keep doing what you're doing, enjoy it, and look at it as like an art or a creative exercise instead of something you have to do. My cousin and I were talking the other day, and I told him my favorite store to go to was like a grocery store. And I just, you know, wander around and find things and in a creative manner. And he was saying the same thing that I would much rather, instead of going to restaurants, which I've done like lots of times in my life, I totally totally love to make my own food and eat it because it's just the way I want. We don't have like noise and waiters and all that sort of thing. It's just like, here I am with my art and I'm, I'm making the food that I love. Yes, absolutely. And that's a, a very powerful story that you share. Thank you for sharing that. Let's go to you, Alan. Can okay. you give us a brief story about your life and your vision loss journey. I know that you are blind and you started with Renee when the show first started or very shortly after. 
But why don't we hear about your journey and then how that led to you being a part of Cooking Without Looking. I was raised by my grandparents until I was about 10 years old up near Toronto, Canada. They were very good to me. They did a lot of wonderful things for me. They did something that I don't think they realized called mainstreaming. You know, where you put them in with everybody else. I sent me out to play with all the other kids. When I skinned my knee, they put a bandaid on me and sent me back out again. The best thing they could have done because I grew up learning how to deal with the real world. And uh, I was about 10 years old and I had to go live with my mother and stepfather up on a farm in Minnesota. Yeah, I got that. Yeah. Stan had a dance hall called Lakeside Pavilion up near Harris, Minnesota. If any of your listeners have to, you know, might bring some memories. He uh, bought a farm when I was first there and put up a big chicken barn. Had, uh, well, uh, about 30,000 total chickens by the time he was all done by the second seven when they got all the buildings up. I was there until I was uh, Minnesota, until I graduated from the University of Minnesota. Yeah, yeah, betcha. As a high school shop teacher with poor eyesight. Yes, I know. I did pretty well, too. Taught for six, eight years, seven years, I think it was. Ended up down here in Florida because I couldn't handle the cold anymore. And uh, I'm going to say it was a few years after I was here. I was running an organization I called the Barrel Club. And Renee came and spoke to us one day and asked if we had any people there that were blind and would like to come down and be part of the audience. And myself and a bunch of other people went down there. Uh, it was at that uh, that kitchen place. Uh, what was the name of it? Sub Zero Kitchens, I think it was. Yes, yes. Uh, and uh, myself and a friend were just kind of wandering around looking at the kitchens, and all of a sudden these lights are in front of me, and somebody says, does your guide dog help you cook in the kitchen? And I says, yes, he's involved with cleanup. <laughs> and they got a little chuckle out of it. And the next thing, Renee came out and she says, would you like to be part of our show? And I <laughs> said, sure, I guess so. I don't know what you want me to cook, but I'll do anything. And she <laughs> just asked me to show up at the TV studio, which I did by Palm Trad Connection, a little scary too. And I walked in. She hands me this script that had to weigh five pounds in big print. Thank you very much, Renee. <laughs> and uh, said so I needed to go and get makeup on. And I look at it, this thing, and that was the first I knew I was actually one of the co-hosts. That was the first day I met Annette, too. Uh, that was kind of cool. We, we were sitting there uh, after we got all uh, got ready. We're sitting there waiting for the show to start. And the guys are giving us some instructions about what to do with the camera. And I forgot, somebody, either Renee, uh, I'm sorry, either Renette or myself asked, how do we know which camera is on? And he says, well, see the little red light up here? And we both kind of looked at each other and chuckled. Well, we're going to say, we don't see the camera, no less little red light. And then we're going to put the uh, script on the teleprompter underneath the TV. Uh, I don't know how big the teleprompter was, but I couldn't see the teleprompter unless the script that was printed on it. But we had to end up sort of memorizing our scripts. And we had the greatest time, but uh, that was back when Celia was with us. And we'd laugh about the script sometimes so they could hardly film it. But I had a <laughs> wonderful time over the last 23 years when I've been able to be here and do this. And I hope it continues on for a long time. That's great. So, Renee, how long was that that you brought uh, Alan in after you started the show? I think probably, I think that was earlier in the year, wasn't it, Alan? And then in September, September 5th, we, we started the show on PBS in South Florida. It may have been, I don't remember exactly how the dates were. I just remember at some point you asked me if I wanted to be on the show, and I said, sure, what do you want me to cook? <laughs> And you never told me. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it's a, there's a funny story about that show. The man who was the program director of that TV station was a friend of mine, and we were on the board of the National Academy of TV Arts and Sciences together, right? And he loved the idea of the show, but he was afraid of what his general manager would say because he thought his general manager would think that people would feel bad for seeing blind people on TV. 
So what he did was he snuck the show on at noon on a Saturday, which is sort of like prime time for them. And the general manager called him and, and like, hey, what is this? And he ended up loving the show. He was like our biggest fan. He would come in during the days of taping. He would actually lend his arm and help people uh, cross over all the wires on the floor. So it was pretty cool. Oh, that's wonderful. And you have another co-host that's Annette Watkins. How did you find her, Renee? Well, we got a sponsor and the sponsor said he knew of someone who might want to be on the show. So he introduced me to Annette. The rest is history. She's been with us this full time too. John Palmer from Magnifying America. Oh, yes. I know him. Yeah. 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 So he was, as well. yeah. he was like our original sponsor. Oh, very nice. Okay. He's a great guy. Yeah, he is. He's like a brother. <laughs> he is. Yeah, it's a small world in the blindness community. Sure. Yeah. So why don't we talk about how the show has evolved in 23 years? I know that the technology has evolved a lot in 23 years, and I'm sure that that has propelled the show in different ways. And now I know, Renee, that you're in Georgia now. So talk about <laughs> how did you get the contract with PBS for the show when it first started? And how has it evolved now on YouTube and now on a podcast form as well? Well, um, we got the contract. With PBS in in uh, South Florida, simply by putting the money down, <laughs> uh, just a week because we had to pay for the production. So whatever money came in went to production, and so then um, we were able to keep the show on. But then at one point we ran out of funds because at that point it was a recession. It was like two thousand nine, and the recession hit and. One of the people who actually were on the show, he, his client was Bernie Madoff. <laughs> and uh, Bernie made off with a lot of people's money. And so the people in that area, in that Palm Beach area, didn't have the money that they once did to sponsor things or whatever. But I wanted to keep it going. So what we did was we, you know, we do interviews like this. We went to wine and food festivals where we did different things. We, we would show people, people cooking at the wine and food festivals. We went to Macy's and invited us in Aventura in Miami. So we went there. The whole store literally shut down to watch us create a recipe, which was pretty cool. Like it, it was the kitchen area was just full of everyone who was in the store once they announced it. And then sort of like fast forward, we had the uh, pandemic and uh, Sylvia Stinson Perez, who's one of the people who's often on our show, she always gives tips uh, for people who are blind or visually impaired. She said, well, Renee, why don't you use Zoom uh, for the show? And, you know, Zoom started big, especially during the pandemic. And you know, the things that we've been able to do with Zoom, we've reached more people in more places around the world that we most definitely did not have the funds to do. <laughs> and if if that's ever a lesson to anyone, like if you have something that you think is so big, but you need a lot of money, you don't. We went to conventions and things and Alan has helped out tremendously with that. We've had a couple of other people who've helped us, you know, financially for different things that we wanted to do. And so we've reached 72 countries between the podcast and the TV show. And it's just been amazing. And now uh, what a lot of people are saying, and, and this was a, a Forbes article, is that people really enjoy watching the YouTube channels, those are even more popular because you can just pick your topic and people like to see real people much more than they like to see the, the usual people that we've seen on TV all these years. I think that's something that has uh, come about. I even find myself watching YouTube channels because they're much more tailored to what we want to see. And we see real people kind of just like us. And Honestly, I've always liked the real people concept. When I first started this, you know, people had these ideas of fame and fortune. And I'm like, they wanted uh, stars on there and everything. I'm like, no, no, 
I just want real people. Now, there's nothing wrong with a star or two, especially if they put in a buck or two. (laughs) (laughs) But I think that people are going to learn so much more about blindness, seeing just like regular Bob and Mary and Sue making their stuff in the kitchen because then they know they can do it too. Yes, that's a wonderful philosophy. And I was very touched in listening to the YouTube and the podcast as well, just as to how much time you took with all the guests, you really take as much time as they want or as they need to share their story. And in a world of very fast paced culture, especially on TV, uh, especially network TV, that's something (laughs) that's not as common today. But the fact that you're able to do that and your style of interviewing and really making the guests feel welcome. I was very touched by that when I listened to some of your podcasts and YouTube episodes. Thank you so much. I find it coming from CBS, it was like, I don't want that to be that. I want people to feel comfortable. And a lot of people haven't been on TV or, you know, on a podcast or whatever. And I like making people feel comfortable. And I also want to honor their stories. We all have stories and be respectful of what their story is. If I'm cutting in and out of their story, their story isn't their story anymore. And Alan, I think it's our Midwestern roots. They People always say say that, you know, we're, we're sort of friendly and, and everything. I know that when people watch us, I would rather have them see a bunch of people who are doing things a little more slowly, but also sort of savoring the moment rather than, you know, just popping in and out like a popcorn, you know, just, okay, well, you know, we don't have enough time. You know, it's not like everything's 28, 30, the way it is in, in regular TV. We can we can take our time. We've got all the time in the world. If we want it long, if we want it short, it's, it's more of a nuanced uh, kind of thing. Oh, yes. And I think that also kind of goes along with food as well. You know, when you think about sitting with other people at a table and sharing food, whether it be cooking food or eating food together, it's one of those things that we all can relate to in terms of family or friends. And the fact that you have that same homegrown feel to your show, I feel like really lends itself well to the topic. So, yeah, I I like food, if you couldn't tell. (laughs) Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Most definitely. Yeah. I don't like when anyone says they want, um, you know, fast meal or anything. I mean, that's not for me. If it's for them, that's cool. But. You know, those those meals that you can have sent to you, everything's all prepackaged and everything, you know, you take all the fun out of it. Uh, why? Why would you want that? But I know people do. If you're not into it as much as we are, that's okay. That's okay. I get it. But for me, you know, like I happily slow cook things, start from the very early morning and, and keep going just because it, it tastes better to me than, than just like speeding everything up and diving through it. You know, you have to, to savor whatever moments you have with it. Absolutely. So before the pandemic, you were doing these shows in person. And how were you getting people there and arranging for the logistical part of the show? Was that something that (laughs) you were able to fly people in or did they have to do that themselves? Or how did that work? Well, we just took people from the area. um, Okay, locally. uh, Right, right. And um, just local people. And sometimes if people were going to be in town, I've never had trouble getting people to be on the show or finding people like they always reach out. But at that time, it was actually more difficult. Like now you just pop on Zoom. Um, We had eight of our shows. We've got more than I think we're up to about 130 shows somewhere in there. Just the TV show part and eight of our shows are in other countries. In fact, this coming in April, we're going to be having uh, some people from Brazil, you know, people who are blind in Brazil. And that's part of where I got the idea for the show, because uh, I was in Brazil for about a month and I visited a lot of the blind organizations there. It's cool. My whole thought 
and, and our thought together is just to bring everyone together, no matter where you are. Now, sometimes language might be a barrier, but we haven't had that problem. Sometimes it's a little harder to understand. Like the people who are going to be on the Brazilian one, although they are from Brazil and, and speak the Brazilian Portuguese, they speak English. So the whole point is to bring everyone together around the world. And whether you're blind or sighted or, or whatever, you know, we're here for you. That's great. See a little something in there? Yeah. I love our modern technology. Isn't it spectacular what we've been able to do over the last 20 years? And especially for those of us who are blind and visually impaired who have a little more difficulty getting around the average person, it is so easy to connect not only with our next door neighbors, but with people all over the world. We wouldn't be able to do what we're doing right now if it wasn't for all of this wonderful stuff. People talk about the good old days. These are the good old days for us. Yes, absolutely. I think it really has opened the door to so many possibilities that would not have been available. And especially now with some of the apps that can read the printed word and can help with some of those practical tasks that just didn't exist up until sometimes 10, five years ago, even then. Now with AI, that technology is really leveraging the playing field as well. So yeah, great point. So let's go to you, uh, Alan. Can you tell us about the frequency of the release schedule of both the TV show and the podcast? How often do you release and how long are your shows generally? Right now, we're doing about one podcast show a month. In fact, we had picked on a special day of the month. I believe it was second or third Thursday, I think it is. I forgot exactly. Yeah, the uh, second Thursday of the month. Second yeah. Thursday, yeah. We were doing them on Wednesdays, but uh, I'm in some community theater. She kindly changed it around to accommodate my theater group. That's worked out quite well. Thank you very much, Renee. Uh, <laughs> sure. <laughs> Anything lasts, for my star. <laughs> the, the show lasts about an hour, and I say about an hour because although we usually get started right on time, which is pretty good, sometimes it goes a little long, and sometimes they're a little bit short. It depends on our guests and uh, the topic of the material. Some guests are a little more talkative than others, and, <laughs> and you know, are all that. <laughs> yeah. We try to have fun with the show. I don't do very much cooking on the show. I, I try to keep people talking and laughing a little bit if I can, you know, like separating two eggs by putting one on each side of the table. <laughs> and by the way, did you, do you know what dog biscuits are made out of? No. Holly flour. Oh. oh. <laughs> Terrible humor. <laughs> but it's a cookie, so I what can you say. Yeah, there you go. You got to have humor in there. <laughs> That's kind of what it's all about, is to kind of make people, uh, to encourage people who have recently lost their sight to stay active in the kitchen. Yeah, there's some things that are a little dangerous, but if you take precautions, you can figure out your way around them. And we try very hard to show a lot of those little precautions. You know, like working over a tray. So if you spill some liquid, it doesn't go down the, on the floor and make a bigger mess. Or uh, wearing a long sleeve hot mitts when you stick stuff in the, in the oven. So little things like that. Yes, a little tip can go a long way, definitely. And they're all very versatile tips and tricks when it comes to cooking and yeah. doing it well. So what is the dynamic for the co-host with you, Alan and Annette? How do you split up some of those duties and how has that come about and evolved? Well, Renee gives us a script for every show that we loosely follow. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we've kind of learned a little trick of, of just kind of turning the talk over to each other. Uh, when she's done, she'll say my name, and I know that's when it's time for me to say something. Because we don't have a lot of visual interaction where we can kind of communicate that way that, that we're passing it off. Uh, and we've gotten fairly good at it, I guess, haven't we? Yes, yes. You, yeah, you guys do a great job. Like, I'm just there under the logo in the corner. <laughs> you guys you guys do a great job. I just give you the script and let you guys go because I know that you, you're going to do a great job. We know that a lot of the people that watch our show are sighted, normally sighted people. And we know that a lot of people are not sighted. 
And I try to remember that the not sighted people need a verbal descriptions of the visual action. So if I can, I try to describe what's going on. But of course, I don't see so well either. So I try to get whoever is cooking to tell me what's going on and how they do this and that. And Annette does the same kind of a thing. So that the audience, whether sighted or not, can keep up with the activity that's going on on TV. Oh, yes, that's a great point. I definitely noticed that as well. I wouldn't want anyone to think that it's not for them being blind, even though it is a TV show, because this is all for the blind and visually impaired. And after all, the blind and visually impaired people are the ones that are doing the cooking. So I found that they are very descriptive and they take a very slow and methodical approach to how they talk about the recipe as they're going so that people can follow it as well. Yes, for those who are seasoned cooks and would like to get some great ideas for recipes, as I mentioned, the show makes you hungry. So if this show hasn't made you hungry, (laughs) then go over to the YouTube channel, Cooking Without Looking, and go over to the podcast and you'll be hungry there if you haven't eaten in a while. So yeah, definitely get a lot of great ideas from that as well. So Renee, you host a podcast, and what was the decision for you to branch off into a podcast and with a YouTube channel? Where has both of those mediums had a benefit? I guess I just like to keep things modern. I like the past as much as everyone, but I I think that we need to keep step with it. And so um, about, let's see, yeah, six years ago, I decided to make the podcast because it seemed like everybody had a podcast. You know, my dog has a podcast. (laughs) (laughs) Especially blind people, yes. (laughs) Right, exactly. And and so I I started doing it and um, I am not like necessarily technologically skilled. It's like once I learn how to do something, I do it rote. I started doing it and then I got stuck. I got stuck. And then one of my friends, he's passed now, but he he was blind, Jason Rosecki. He was like Mr. Techie, Techie Rosecki. And I go, Jason, I am stuck. I've gotten this far and I don't know how to do the rest. And he told me to put the MP4 in. That was all I needed to do. And I, I was like, well, okay. You know, after being stuck for six months, it took them like less than a minute to tell me what to do and how to figure it out. And, you know, the rest is history. But most of it is I like to stay up with the technology because if you fall behind, you know, people aren't aren't going to listen to you. They aren't going to tune in. And I just like to keep everything moving forward. Oh, yes. And is there any post-production or editing that has to be done either for the YouTube or the podcast? Or do you upload as is? I upload as is because, okay, there were only two of the TV shows where I did a little bit of editing, but they were my mistakes. I like to keep it very honest and authentic. And if if it looks like maybe there wasn't a mistake, except that the cooks on our show have been like totally amazing. There really haven't been mistakes. But if there was, you know, it's not very authentic to take it out and people go, oh yeah, they just edited it out because they're blind. They're trying to make it look better. So it's all sort of like, as we used to say, live on tape. We just do it all live by the seat of our pants. If I remember correctly, wasn't our sighted cook that one time making more mistakes than the blind cook? Yeah, well, yeah, you mean the last one a couple months ago when we did that in January. That was fun. I liked that. That was fun. (laughs) <laughs> it, it was we did blind versus sighted and that was her mom is like blind totally blind and then the daughter who lives with her was blindfolded and she knows some of the tricks and things but yeah she flung some parmesan cheese across the room you know i was like whoa <laughs> <laughs> yeah it was kind of funny it was funny Well, I'd like to ask you both something that might be a hard question because it sounds like there's so many great programs that you've done over the years. What would be one favorite program that sticks out to you both if you had to pick one that was very memorable and meaningful for you both? Alan? (laughs) Oh, a lot of fun. I guess maybe the very first show I actually did was probably the most meaningful. It was a real surprise to me. 
And I was very honored and uh, that, that Renee had selected me to be her host. So I guess it was maybe that very first show. Oh, let's see. The, the one with the kids in it was a lot of fun, too. Those are kind of remote, memorable. Yeah, we had the blind kids from the School for the Deaf and the Blind of St. Augustine, Florida. Yeah. That was that was great. There was so much great energy because they were young. You know, it's, it's like a lot of fun. I, I like having the kids on. Oh, very nice. It was that show we did down in Morikami Park where I thought the alligator was going to get my guide dog. Uh, yeah. <laughs> the Murakami Park is actually pretty cool because it's a Japanese gardens. And if you are blind or visually impaired at each station, they have a like a phone like you pick up and, and you can hear whatever the thing is there, like whatever kind of plants or kind of animals. And a net fainted on that one she she got like a little overheated on that one i think we were doing some grilling on this deck that was over a, a body of water and i had my <laughs> guide dog on a downstand the dog was really getting nervous and i couldn't figure out why and then somebody pointed out to me that uh, directly underneath was this about a three four foot alligator <laughs> oh wow we made a little move at that point, I think, if I remember. <laughs> <laughs> that was a lot of fun. So in addition to the podcast and the YouTube channel, I know that you also have a website where you share some tips and tricks that are helpful for the blind and visually impaired in cooking. Can you talk about that, Renee? Sure. I still have a list of recipes from the listservs, like, from years and years and years. I, I went back, it's like at least six years worth of recipes from, and they're all people who are blind or visually impaired who have submitted those recipes. And I use them to each day, I, it's Monday through Friday. I choose a recipe and I put it there, uh, the Cooking Without Looking TV show recipe of the day. And then I have a matching a tip to go along with it, uh, the Cooking Without Looking TV show kitchen hack of the day. So if we're like, if we make a Mexican casserole like we did the other day on the podcast, then I will take and find a tip like, you know, how to make your best casserole, how to keep things from getting soggy, things like that. So they they pair up. I, that was something I learned over the years. I just started doing that recently because um, I thought, well, yeah, if I'm making if I'm making this recipe, you might want tips for this recipe instead of just using random tips, which is what I was doing. So I found that to be really a lot of fun. And the, the people on the show and the podcast all submit their own recipes. And then I name the recipe after them. And I put their picture on it along with the, the photo of the uh, recipe of the food. Oh, that's great. So can you give the listeners the website where they can find all that information? Yes, it's www.cookingwithoutlookingtv.wordpress.com. Okay, great. And that'll be in the show notes for everyone. And you can also go to YouTube and your podcast app of choice and type in Cooking Without Looking and you'll find all the episodes of the podcast and the YouTube channel. And you also upload the podcast to the YouTube channel as well. Yeah, some of them get uploaded. Um, it just depends. I'm on Podbean. So it's like a one, a one a week. If I do more than one show a week, they upload one of the um, podcasts. And also, we're on all Alexa-enabled devices. So you just have to say the Cooking Without Looking TV show. And we're also on the Victor Reader. So I know a lot of blind people use that as well. So I'd like to talk a little more about some of the advantages that the blind have in terms of cooking. What do you think would be one of the most valuable pieces of advice that you learned from the show in terms of cooking and how you were able to apply that to your own lives? Oh, that's a great question. I use a lot of the tips myself. And I think one of the ones that I love the most is that your food is done when you smell it. And the one about like, if you're cutting an onion, to cut it in half and then put the flat portion on the cutting board and then you can cut from there. And you don't have a rolling onion all over the place. You're not chasing your onion. So I think those are two of my favorite tips. Great. 
Knowing your kitchen, I think, is probably the best tip. Being familiar with where everything is in your kitchen is probably the best tip I know of. Also, little things like, uh, you know, using a tray so you don't spill things, a magnetic knife rack. There's a million little things that just help make life a little bit easier if you don't see so well. That's all great tips, all great advice. Well, we talked about a lot of the encounters that you've had with the guests and the feedback that they gave. So what has been the feedback from those who've watched the show over the years and listened to the podcast and watch it on YouTube? What kind of feedback have you received from the general public, either sighted or blind? Uh, real quick, a long time ago, I was going through the Atlanta airport, having a cup of coffee right for a flight, and somebody came over to me and says, I saw you on the Cooking Without Looking show. I couldn't believe it. <laughs> it's amazing. That's awesome. <laughs> the nicest things that people have said, and they often say them in the same ways that were sort of fun and friendly. To me, you know, that's like the greatest compliment because that's really what I think we strive for. When people are guests on the show, I'll tell them, listen, you know, no one's going to die here today. Well, our whole purpose is to have fun. And uh, if you have fun, well, that's the main thing. You know, that's the main thing that we hope for. But they usually just say fun and friendly. I, I love that. Oh, very nice. Yeah, kind of like what I had said a little while ago. The friendly exactly. atmosphere. Yes. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You you said the same thing. You know, it's it, it's good to know that that comes across. After being in TV and, and you know, sometimes personality sort of gnaw at each other and you think that, oh, yeah, but when I'm on the screen, it looks different. No, you can, you can feel the way people feel when they react to one another. <laughs> If, if people are stressed, you can notice that too. I mean, you don't even have to see it. You don't have to have eyesight to feel like people are being stressed out or they're angry or whatever. So we like to keep it loose and fun. We need lots more good news and lots less bad news. That's right. Yes, and a lot more good food too, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, you know, after we're all done cooking without looking, then we get to eating without seeing. Oh, there you go. All right. Sometimes, <laughs> if the wine gets a little free, it's drinking without thinking. <laughs> <laughs> that's afterward. Yeah, right. <laughs> after the show's over, that's right, yes. <laughs> I know that you said you've never been in a shortage of finding guests. And is it safe to say that for folks who are listening today who consider themselves a cook and have a recipe that they'd like to share with the world can reach out to you and possibly look at getting on the show? Oh, yeah, of course. And the podcast, too, you know, both of them. I have never turned anyone down at all. That's the whole thing. We've had like recipes that are complicated and then very simple recipes. So everybody is always, always, always invited. We'd love to have you. Well, that's great. I would definitely encourage all the listeners who feel like this is something for them to share their story and share their recipe. And I will say that I believe as blind people and visually impaired people, we do have an advantage in the kitchen because my great aunt is legally blind and she is an Italian cook. And she always uh -huh. told me she does everything by feel to the point uh -huh. where she couldn't really tell others her recipe because it all had to do with how the texture of the food feels. And uh, she sure. makes meatballs. So when she would talk about the meat, it would be how the texture of the meat feels. And that's something that you can't always measure with the eyes. It's something that you have to feel and have a knack for to really get that down. So I would say like anything else, we do have the advantage in certain respects there. Oh, yeah, most definitely. Like, I, I think that, you know, there's been too much. Uh, when kids are growing up, they tell them not to touch this and I think just the opposite. No, you know, feel, touch, you know, that's, you are, that's a good point because um, oftentimes people will ask, well, how do I know if, if something is done? Especially they're always asking that for chicken. Well, if you take a wood spoon and you can, you can like, uh, you know, I mean, you can take your fingertips too if you want, but it might be sort of hot. But you can feel with that wood spoon um, if it's like a little spongy 
or if it's a little stronger so that um, you know if it's done. And then again, using the smell technique. Yeah, the, the touch technique, though, that, that's something that you kind of have to develop after you do it for a while. You get a feel for that kind of thing. No uh, pun intended. For seasoned cooks. <laughs> but, you know, for new people, uh, I like timers. Yeah, it takes so many minutes to cook my burger. Four minutes for my burger in a George Foreman grill. I already know that. Don't have to touch it with a spoon. And I know it's cooked right. There's just different ways of doing things for different people, yes. Sure, sure. Oh, yes. And I know we talked earlier about technology. I know you did a air fryer segment as well. That's one of the things that has been more recently popular in the blind community as one of the handy tools. You're right. You're right. Um, that's just blown up. I mean, the Instapot there was there for a while, but... The air fryer is huge in the blind community. So I know that you both have an exciting announcement to make, which is related to how we connected and got together to do this mm -hmm. interview. Would you like to share that with us, Renee? Uh, sure, sure. Well, your group is creating a very special jingle for us for our TV show. We had something a long time ago, but I really like this. It's up be it's fun we haven't heard the final product yet but just the demo was very nice and uh it, it was great it was it was upbeat enjoyable and it even has singing in it which was cool yes yeah, so i'm involved in the serenity choir that's how we were able to reach out to you and be able to share the talent of the music and contribute to your wonderful mission. And that'll be coming to the show very shortly, I believe. I think so. They said like around the end of March or, or you know, beginning of April. So we're really excited to hear that and add it on the show. That will be, of course, something I, I learned to put on the YouTube channel. <laughs> <laughs> that, will, that will be stretching my skills a little more, which is cool. <laughs> yeah, it is really nice. And, and that night when I spoke with all of you guys, that was so wonderful because you're from all over the world and, and you get together and you, you make your music. And that's the way life should be. We just get together and uh, create our happiness. Oh, well, as I had said before, you were so gracious to take your time and speak with us. And I'm glad you did because that's we were able to connect. So as we close the interview today, I'd like for each of you to share a tip. I know we've talked a lot about tips, but <laughs> I'd like a specific tip, one more, for those who would like to get into the field of cooking and they're blind or visually impaired, or those who are sighted who know someone who's blind or visually impaired who would like to give them guidance and give them encouragement as to something that can get them started into cooking. Well, there are always the schools. Some cooking schools are a little behind the times and are afraid to have a blind students because they're just confused about what to do. But normally you reach out to a school, maybe you reach out to a, like a local restaurant tour who maybe needs a sous chef in the kitchen. I know that there are quite a few sous chefs who are blind or, or visually impaired. I'm thinking one in particular, he's up in New York. Or... <laughs> Just start cooking. Just just do it and maybe even create your own YouTube channel or reach out to people who um, you think are able to help. In Miami, there's FIU, Florida International University School of Hospitality. There was actually a professor there who was blind who taught. He was like the, the first person who hosted our show. He's not there anymore, but they're very, very uh, hands-on with people who are blind or visually impaired who want to enter that field. Oh, that's a great tip. And I actually know Deborah Erickson. I don't know if you both yeah, know her know who runs the Blind Kitchen. And she started out when she became visually impaired. She went to a culinary school and learned how to cook that way. And then she was able to take her knowledge and develop a lot of adaptive equipment for the kitchen. Yeah, one of those great success stories of how that can really help someone and also help a lot of other people as well with that knowledge. 
Right. I, I know, Deborah. we both teach. Um, I, I've got like a little class. We call it a cook along the first Tuesday of the month for the Blind United uh, who are out of California. And she's on a Wednesday during the month. It's just a lot of fun with that group, too. It's I, We choose a recipe and then I prepare it and, and give them tips on preparing it. Oh, wonderful. And uh, Alan, your tip to close us today? Mine is pretty short and easy to the blind community. Don't be afraid. Just be careful. Remember, you're working with hot things. Protect yourself from the hot things. You're working with sharp things. Remember where the sharp edge is. Just don't be afraid to get in the kitchen. Just be careful. Oh, that's great. That's a wonderful life lesson for in and out of the kitchen for a blind and sighted alike. So exactly. Wonderful. I would like to thank you both for coming on to Blind Abilities today and talking about the wonderful mission of Cooking Without Looking and the work that you're doing. I wish you much success in the future. So you have 23 years. Well, uh, here's to 23 more to go and beyond, I'd like to say. so. <laughs> well, thank you, Simon. I hope I'm alive. <laughs> <laughs> it's getting there, but um, thank you so much for having us. We really appreciate it. Yes, thank you very much, Simon, for this opportunity. Yeah, it's been my pleasure. It's been fun. Well, to the listeners, I'd encourage you to go to YouTube, go to your podcast players, Type in Cooking Without Looking or go to the website www.cookingwithoutlookingtv.wordpress.com and again, all of that information will be there for you in the show notes to browse at your convenience. We thank you for listening and we hope you're not hungry or maybe if you are, maybe you go in the kitchen and uh, cook something and then come on the show. So I know that everyone would, would appreciate you to come on the show for the listeners that would like to share their story, share their recipe, as I mentioned, and you have a really great group there. It's really been great talking to Renee and Alan. And as I said, I wish them much success. So thank you for listening and have a great day. For more podcasts with the Blindness Perspective, check us out on the web at www.blindabilities.com, on Twitter at BlindAbilities, and download the free Blind Abilities app from the App Store and Google Play Store. That's two words, Blind Abilities. And if you want to leave some feedback, give us some suggestions, give us a call at 612-367-6093. We'd love to hear from you. I want to thank you for listening, and until next time, bye-bye. When we share what we see through each other's eyes, eyes, we can then then begin begin to bridge bridge the the gap between between the limited limited expectations and the reality of blind abilities. abilities.